All right, it is 2.03, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Making History, a panel discussion about writing and publishing history. This event is part of the San Francisco History Days, which is an annual event that highlights local history and connects the public with independent historians, local organizations, and the wider historical community. History Days has a full slate of fun and informative programs that uh, has been scheduled for this entire weekend. So please check out sfhistorydays.org for more information. Many of the events that happen on Friday and Saturday are recorded and so you can um, catch up with those events um, that way. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco who is hosting this event in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference and the San Francisco Historical Society. For those of you unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, uh, a culture, we're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. Now, right now, due to the shelter in place, all of our activities are virtual, virtually all of them, um, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. Uh, it's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. So we have a great lineup of professionals uh, in the history biz to talk to you today. Let me introduce them briefly. Their longer bios are on the event website, which I will add to the chat space, and then we'll get started. Um, so first up, we have Lee Bruno, who is an author and a journalist with two history books under his belt. Uh, he is currently a developmental editor with the Collective Book Studio and Cameron and Company. Then we have Lana Costantini, who is Director of Education and Publishing for the San Francisco Historical Society. Um, she is the editor of The Argonaut, which is that society's award-winning history journal and its newsletter, The Panorama. Then we have Francis Dinkelspiel, who is the author of two best-selling history books, and the co-founder and executive editor of Berkeley Side, which is an online news site uh, in Berkeley, California. And then we have Chris Gruner, uh, who has been involved in the publishing industry for most of his adult life. Uh, and since 2009, he has been the publisher for Cameron and Company. Uh, and then last but not least is Lori Krill, who is the West Coast Acquisitions Editor for the History Press. Um, which is, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but it's a publisher that specializes in local and regional history and really culture from coast to coast. All right, so each panelist will speak for a few minutes about themselves and their publishing experiences, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So please post them in the chat space and we will try to answer all of them because I think uh, with this panel that the conversation is really gonna be uh, the exciting part. All right, thank you so much for coming today and let's go ahead and get started. Let me uh, introduce Lee Bruno. Hi, Lee. Hi, Taryn. Um, thanks again for doing this uh, panel and uh, inviting me. And it's interesting, I, I'm wearing the same shirt that Chris Gruner is, so I guess I'm in line with the publisher that <laughs> It's one of those hot days. Um, so, my background <clears throat> was um, early 1990s, I went and got a master's degree in, in journalism. I was actually working in a research laboratory doing bench science uh, before that, but I needed, um, I just had this compulsion to go and get um, a master's degree and I got it with a concentration in science journalism. And then the uh, ascent of the uh, technology industry was underway and so those jobs paid pretty well. So. Uh, I found myself, you know, sort of following that path for um, all the way through the dot-com boom and bust and uh, thereafter. And um, it wasn't until after my great, uh, my 
grandmother uh, died that I came across uh, a really interesting letter that had been sent uh, by my uh, by my grandfather uh, to his uh, father-in-law, R.B. Hale. And uh, it was just a very simple letter, and I kind of talk about it in Panorama, but it really kind of uh, made me scratch my head and ask questions that I, at the time, I couldn't ask my grandmother because she was already passed, and we hadn't had those kinds of conversations. So I started digging into letters and uh, books that I could find, not as a trained historian, but just trying to get to the, some of the sources. And I found you know, a large amount of great material at the California Historic, uh, uh, Historical Society. Uh, so dug into letters and speeches. And um, over some, you know, sort of a broken, un, a broken and unbroken period of eight years, you know, that wasn't really all working during that time, but really was able to come together and create a, a series of stories. I think there was probably the, the core was somewhere around um, 10 to 12. And, um, but the first one really out the door was to try to sort of capture what did my great grandfather do as a director at the, of the Pan Pacific Exposition Fair of 1915, San Francisco's kind of officially first international fair. Um, so that really began, uh, you know, the, the, the research and, and sort of the, the curiosity. And then um, at the urging of my, uh, one of the editors that I was working with, you know, um, she said, I think you have what, I think you have the, you know, the makings of a book here and I think you should pursue that. Well, that was a long odyssey. And so um, it, uh, it ended up that I ended up, um, uh, getting in touch with Chris Gruner through a, 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 a friend uh, that we both know. And so uh, that sort of coincidence of kind of going all the way out to all these different um, publishers and then coming back into your back door to Petaluma was quite a, uh, quite, a, you know, I don't know. It's like, a, it was just a, it was just a, a wonderful sort of experience uh, to be connected with somebody locally. And that began uh, the, uh, the, that became the, um, the first book, Panorama, um, Tales from San Francisco's uh, First World's uh, Fair. Um, that's probably not the sub, sub headline, but anyway, I, um, I feel that uh, one of the things that I, I think I learned and I, I continue to kind of like pay attention to um, is really, um, you know, follow your curiosity if you have something uh, interesting. Um, don't give up on it. Keep keep uh, hacking away at it, and really try to find um, the essence of the story. I think it did help for me to have a journalism background and some writing experience. But you know, not as a trained historian, I need to run things by historians. And um, uh, the other part was taking um, a couple of screenwriting uh, screenwriting um, workshops, sort of to understand how to set scenes and try to do narrative journalism. I think, you know, those are some of the tools that I think helped, but uh, I have to take my hat off to the Mechanics Institute for the great librarians and also just opening up um, and also at the California Historical Society and the Bancroft for, you know, all their efforts in opening up uh, a treasure trove of material that I don't think I would have uh, been able to unearth on my own. So that's kind of my overview and intro and um, I'll switch it back to Taryn. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. All right, let, um, let us talk now to Lana. Okay, hi everyone. It's uh, Lana Constantini here from San Francisco Historical Society. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Taryn, for hosting and for including me in the panel. So I got my start in, in publishing um, actually through creative writing. I have an MFA in creative writing from the University of Montana. The problem with that was that when I started looking for writing jobs in creative writing, they really weren't there that I could find. So um, my other love was education. And for me, educational publishing was sort of the perfect meeting place of publishing, writing, editing, and education. So I was in educational publishing for about 25 years in all kinds of capacities from writer to editor to project manager to business owner to director of product development. So I've sort of seen all the the, the size of, of this. And I guess one, one of my messages to, to you who are interested in publishing in the history space is that 
educational publishing has a lot of opportunity in it. And um, I'll explain a little bit about what those opportunities are. There are ma major publishers in the United States, like uh, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, uh, Discovery Education, um, Pearson, and they create massive social studies programs on a cycle of a new one every, say, five to eight years. And when they're embarked on a development cycle, it's usually a two-year or three-year cycle for a program that would be a K-8 or a K-12 or some subset of that. And they need content and they need historians to write that content. And the, the challenge there is that a lot of people who are professional historians who have the knowledge and the skill don't necessarily write for kids because to write for kids is a whole different thing. They're unforgiving audience and if they're bored, they will let you know. So it's sort of like learning to write with a bit of a twist and getting some more engaging stuff in there so that you can hold the younger audience's attention. So some of those opportunities include either writing articles for a series or oftentimes they'll hire people as content developers and editors for that whole two to three year period as a freelance job. So there, there are some opportunities there that are, and also you get your name out, you know, you, you know, you get listed as authors in some of these programs and it can help boost your profile in the world. Um, in addition to, to social studies programs, because cross-curricular content is so big now in education, history, history articles, primary source materials have made their way into all the other curricular areas, um, English language arts. If you read a typical English language arts book to, of today, you'll find a lot of history. You'll find science. You'll find all kinds of things that you wouldn't have found 25 or 30 years ago. So um, that's a, another opportunity. And then there's the world of children's magazines. And I've worked for a number of, of them too. Um, some of the ones that are big um, now, or at least big when I was in educational publishing, Cobblestone Magazine, Cricket Magazine, Reading Rockets, National Geographic Explorer, which is their, their kids' magazines. So they have kids' magazines in both science and social studies. And I've written for both of them. And they pay pretty well. And again, they're always looking for content. They've got all these magazines at different grade levels. And um, so that's, that's a place worth looking. Um, similar to that, there's websites. Right now we've got a lot of websites, PBS, Time for Kids. I mean, the list really goes on and on and they need content. And that's not really written content, it's more of um, it's the content you find on the web, but they still need somebody to conceptualize it and write the scripts or write, you know, write the, the content for it, who knows what they're, they're talking about. So um, these are just sort of like little niches that are available for people who wanna write in, in the history space. Um, and what, what other is adult magazines. I did a quick look, um, before this call on the internet, there seem to be 50 or 60 solid history magazines published today around the country. And one, one of those is The Argonaut, which I've been editing for about 15 years. I think historical journals are great in, in a lot of ways. One is that you can get published in there if you haven't been published with in a lot of other places, or maybe you haven't been published at all. A lot of the larger trade book publishers look for people who already have a name, they're already a published writer. But like at the Argonaut, it doesn't really matter to us. I mean, we're really looking for original writing and research on aspects of San Francisco history that have been either not explored as much as they should be explored, or what's been said is wrong, or just, you know, th there hasn't been extensive research done. For instance, our last uh, issue of the Argonaut got a really great article on the history of Germans, the German community in San Francisco, very, very scant ha had been done about that. So it's really great to find somebody who's got a passion in, in that, um, who's willing to write for the Argonaut. Um, and then, you know, once you've got a couple Argonaut articles, you can use those to, to move forward with larger things. For instance, we had an author, uh, Jim Haas, who uh, used to be on our board, who wrote two, ar two articles on the history of Civic Center in two different issues of the Argonaut. They were both long, meaty articles. But with professional editing that we provide and professional design and a very nice published piece, he's able to take those two pieces to a publisher and say, look, I've got these and they're great and they've been well received. And he actually, about a year ago, published a book on the history of, uh, of Civic Center. So um, 
there's just a lot of different ways to, to, to get into it. And, you know, I, I mean, we will talk, I'm sure later about self-publishing as an option. If what you're doing isn't, doesn't necessarily need to go through a traditional publishing process, but, and I guess my main message is there's a lot of different ways to get your work out there in front of people. And, um, and a lot of them, you know, everything I've mentioned, they're not super money makers, not if you wrote, like if you wrote a big bestseller, but they could be a source of income, especially if you get hooked into a, uh, like a children's magazine, they'll call you again and again to write as often as they can. So anyway, that is what I have to offer. Thank you. That was a wonderful. Um, uh, let's go through the alphabet. Francis, welcome. Thank you. So I just have to respond, uh, Lana. I love that article on the German uh, Germans in San Francisco. I, I, I read it uh, by myself when I was eating dinner one night, the whole thing. It's very long. Excellent. Thank you. But, but you know, my, my book about Isaiah Hellman, he was a German Jew, and there was a very strong German Jewish community in San Francisco. So it was very interesting to learn about other aspects of that. And I also just have to say, Lee, like um, I could just go ditto what you said, and that is my own personal story, which is really funny. And uh, another thing about how small San Francisco is, I know you wrote about Hale in um, Panorama. Well, my relatives also served on the PPIE board. And, you know, so there are always connections when you're doing history and you learn so much about the place you come from. Um, so my story is that I was a history major in college, and when I got out of college, I started to be a newspaper reporter, and I was a traditional newspaper reporter. I worked at the Mercury News for a long time, and I started to want to try to do some longer pieces at, at a certain point, especially after I'd started to have children. And um, I decided I wanted to write personal essays as a way to do that, and I... Uh, started to do that and I realized I didn't know much about my own family history. I, I'm a fifth generation Californian and I knew my great great grandfather Isaiah Hellman had come and had been involved with Wells Fargo Bank um, and I want to learn more. So like Lee, I went down to the California Historical Society and uh, thought I'd just poke around and find a couple anecdotes that I could weave into some personal essays. Uh, but the archivist when I asked to look at some papers of I.W. Hellman said, which box would you like to look at? We have, you know, 40 boxes of his documents, you know, 50,000 pages. And so I didn't know what to say. I said, you know, how about box number one? And uh, he brought it out to me and I opened it. And the first thing I saw was something that was like a report card from, from Germany in the 1850s. The next thing I saw was something was like a land contract from Los Angeles in 1860. And the third thing was a letter from a guy named Herman to Isaiah Hellman talking about he was living in Wilmington, Los Angeles, and it was so boring. And he thanked his brother for sending him a book because he finally had something to do. And like these were three documents that I had no idea what they meant, but you know, they immediately got, caught my attention and I want to know more. And I found myself going back to the California Historical Society day after day, whenever I could, to go through these papers of my great great grandfather. And, you know, the more I read, uh, the, the, the more excited I got because I felt like I had I had a story in those boxes about a man who come to California as sort of a penniless Jew, settled in Los Angeles moved up to San Francisco, had along the way been involved in about the creation of eight different industries in California. The last one uh, probably he's most famous for, for uh, is being president of Wells Fargo Bank. And um, so I decided I want to write a book about this. Uh, but like Lee, you know, I was a journalist, like, you know, the inverted pyra pyramid is my form of writing. Uh, so I actually had to teach myself a lot how to write a narrative nonfiction book, a book that had characters, that had narrative arc, that had tension, that had drama, uh, all these kind of things in order to make somebody really want to read a book. And, and it took me about uh, 10 years from the idea to the publication of the book. Um, I did have uh, children in between. I had been working at the Mercury News. I eventually left that job. Um, and uh, my first book was called Towers of Gold uh, about Isaiah Hellman and the creation of California and the role that Jews played in the creation of California, which was a very under uh, discussed issue. 
because you know when people think about the Jewish settlement in the United States, they often think about you know the the factories in New York City and people living in tenement houses and stuff. But what happened in California was very different. From the beginning, Jews were embraced and accepted in California. They were actually considered white being in California, whereas in Germany and Central Europe, they were considered other. And um, so after that uh, book came out, um, you know. When you write a book, there are always certain things that uh, you know remain in your mind. And one of the things that I found out about was that Isaiah Hellman in 1901 had purchased a big interest in something called the California Wine Association, which was a monopoly that controlled about 80% of the wine production and distribution in California for many years. And I had never heard of that, and I was really intrigued by that. And um, uh, and then one day, um, so Isaiah Hellman was also involved in making of wine. He, he, he bought a, a rancho in, uh, in Cucamonga in, 187, in, in the 1870s, um, uh, and he made wine from there. And one day there was a big warehouse fire in Vallejo uh, that destroyed four and a half million bottles of wine. And some of the wine that was destroyed had been made by my great-great-grandfather. And my cousin had put it there, or someone had put it there for her as a storage place. And when I discovered that there was this wine uh, arson and it had destroyed this wine by a W. Hellman, I remembered the California Wine Association. I thought, this is my opportunity to write a sort of a story that has some crime in it and has a lot of California history, and I can talk about the California Wine Association. So that led to my next book, Tangled Vines. And, um, uh, I just want to say that uh, the thing I love the most probably is the research. You know, there's something called research rapture where you just can't stop researching because there's so much fun things to find. Um, you know, I love uh, going through those documents at the Historical Society. When I was doing Tangled Vines, there's a big murder in there, and um, there was a man in the 1870s who kept a, uh, a set of journals. And he had documented that murder. And I went to the Bancroft Library and I was able to look at the, the journal he had created with the you know, newspaper articles of the time and his hand-drawn maps and all that kind of thing. And I just was like shivering in my seat, you know, thinking I am connected to this past through this document. And that's really what I love about uh, history, writing history, is trying to connect today to the past and do it in a way that's, uh, that's interesting and that people want to read about. Um, so that's, that's really my story. So, oh, but I'm still a journalist, so I haven't had time to do as much history writing as I'd like. So, thanks. That's wonderful. Um, I remember years ago, you must have been working on the wine book, but I saw you at the California Historical Society in the library, and I had just finished reading Isaiah Hellman, um, but you were deep in rapture, and so I didn't want to bother you. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, Chris. Here we go. You? Can you? Am I here now? I can hear you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Taryn, for the invitation, and nice to hear everybody speaking. You guys seem like the, the real experts. I just like to publish books, and you guys are writing them, and making beautiful things and telling beautiful stories. But um, just for a brief introduction, uh, my name is Chris Gruner. Uh, I run a company here in Petaluma called Cameron and Company. I've worked in publishing my whole career uh, after a brief stint of teaching high school English down in Los Angeles. Uh, quickly uh, lost that bug and had no desire to do that anymore. Um, figured I'd chase the big cash of book publishing, uh, the big reward there. Um, so I, I I danced around with different publishing companies and distributors for several years, always here in the Bay Area. Um, and then in 2009, my wife and I um, got the brilliant idea to take over her grandfather's uh, business, Cameron and Company, which he had started back in the 60s. Uh, her grandfather was Robert Cameron, and he published a, a book in 1964 called The Drinking Man's Diet. Um, which was sort of on a whim and turned him into a book publisher basically overnight once Herb Cain wrote about it and sort of put him on the map. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. He sold two and a half million copies and published in 13 languages. 
and then uh, he rode that way for a few years. And then in, in 1969, he published uh, his very first book of aerial photography above San Francisco, which he did with his uh, friend Herb Kane. Um, and then went on, you know, many of you maybe have seen his books over the years. He did Los Angeles, above New York, uh, above Chicago, Paris, London, always partnering usually with some sort of uh, renowned sort of face of the city. And oftentimes that was an historian of some sort. So he worked with uh, Alistair Cook, Pierre Salinger. Um, and then of course, in the San Francisco books, uh, he worked with uh, Arthur Hoppe after um, Herb Kane. And then uh, kind of fast forward and I'll come back to this, but then a couple of years ago, we had the idea of publishing a 50th anniversary edition of Above San Francisco, um, which I have behind me here, if you can't see. And that was with Carl Nolte providing the, the forward for that book to so kind of bring it full circle and tapping into San Francisco's sort of, uh, at least from the Chronicle standpoint, their uh, history expert in-house. So anyway, uh, in 2009, when we took it over, we moved it up here to Petaluma where we had settled, um, started raising our children and um, just kind of decided to go bullish on book publishing, which not a lot of people were doing in 2009. You know, there's a lot of, talk of the death of print um, and you know we just naively kind of just decided to give it a go and think what what could we do in this 21st century um, that would be fresh and unique and you know what works and what doesn't obviously we've we've hit some bumps in the roads and um, taken a while to figure it out but really what we we have honed in on for us at Cameron and Company is uh, this tagline that we use called books that need to be books um, and that can go both ways. That could be about, um, you know, books that need to be physical books, like uh, books that really don't translate in the digital space, um, because obviously there's a time and a place for uh, digital books. If you're going to the on a vacation or, um, you know, you need, need to be mobile. Um, but the types of books that we publish tend to be those that are uh, visual and illustrated um, type projects that really don't translate uh, the same in that digital space, but also just books that need to be books in the sense that these are books that canonize a moment in history or they, they um, you know, put in the archives forever um, some point in time um, that wouldn't otherwise happen if it weren't for a book. And, you know, digital feels a lot more ethereal, um, much less permanent, obviously, whereas a book, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so I won't lament this too much, but, um, the, the book holds uh, a special place in capturing a moment in time um, like nothing else really can. And it's, it's a better technology in many ways than all these high tech companies think they're working on. So anyway, we've um, uh, been pu publishing books with Cameron and company for 11 plus years now. Um, had the great fortune of connecting with Lee. And I love how Lee and I met, he didn't give the specifics, but our mutual friend um, is this woman, Patty Norman who is a good friend of ours. And Patty Norman is a children's book specialist at Copperfield's Books in Petaluma, and also a part of um, the swimming club that Lee is a part of in San Francisco. And so um, I just love how things kind of connect that way. And then, um, so Lee kind of pitched us his book uh, called Panorama about the 1915 exposition. And um, we also had the good fortune of, um, you know, here in the Bay Area, obviously we're, we're rich in history um, but we also have people who are patrons of the arts who appreciate the arts and preserving history in a way that, um, you know, maybe uh, wouldn't happen otherwise if it weren't for their support. So Lee and I connected with a, a wonderful company here in town who, or here in San Francisco, who just really loves to support um, the arts and support San Francisco specifically and Northern California and generally um, with history books. And so we've We've done several projects um, with them as well, and that's been wonderful. So with Lee, we've done Panorama. We did Misfits, Merchants, and Mayhem, which is another beautiful book. I know that Show and Tell isn't usually great on Zoom calls, but this is another fun project we did with Lee. And then just the beauty of publishing and networking, you know, uh, Lee connected us with uh, a gentleman, Jim Shine, who with his wife run Shine and Shine, I think it is, a map store in North Beach. Although I think I just heard from Jim that they're moving things up to Sonoma um, just uh, recently with all that's going on. But we did a book, which I don't have here at home, and I feel uh, bummed about that, but it's a beautiful book called Gold Mountain, Big City, all about Chinatown based on this map that Jim um, has uh, by this wonderful 
not very well known San Francisco cartographer back in the 40s uh, called Karen Cathcart. Oh my gosh, somebody, Karen's got a book there. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> it's really a beautiful book. And it was fun just because this map tells so many stories in and of itself. And so we just use that map as a jumping off point to um, tell the whole story of the book. So, you know, there's so many fun, interesting, fascinating, sad, dark, heavy, as you can imagine, um, uh, uh, stories that come out from this map. Um, but it's beautiful. And the book includes a, a fold out map, of course, as well. So as you can see from some of these books, too, we we're big on production quality. We love, you know, bells and whistles. We love using foil, um, the fold out map in the book, you know, a special paper that's probably 20 cents too expensive, but we just do it anyway. And, um, you know, just sort of focusing in on that um, has been our, our, uh, our joy. And then just recently, so, so we focus on visual books. We do have an imprint called Roundtree Press, um, which is a little bit more of a hybrid publishing model. Um, and we have done some text-driven books there. Um, we did a book uh, about the Stanford, the Stanford men's basketball program, which was a history book in a way, um, of course. And then um, we did a book with Lowell Cohn, uh, who's a sports writer, all text. But anyway, um, just the, earlier this month, and we're sort of fresh on the heels of this, but we actually just got acquired by a company called Abrams Books in New York. Um, it's a wonderful art book publisher who's been our distributor for the last few years. Um, and we're really excited about that because they see in us um, this West Coast presence. They love that we're in the San Francisco area. Um, they're investing in us. And I bring that up because I think that one of the things they like about what we do is that we're, um, you know, on, you know, with feet on the ground and we, we are privy to what's going on regionally here. Again, it's such a rich, rich region that we're living in. And there is a future for regional publishing. Um, which, you know, in a way is shocking, I think, in this, you know, 15 years after people started predicting the death of the printed book, now people, you know, there's companies that are getting venture capital to support their micro regional book publishing program, which just seems like shocking to me, um, but also very exciting and encouraging. So, you know, one of the things that Abrams saw in us and bringing us on was um, the fact that we publish in this space, that, that, that we're aware of what's going on, you know, in areas that they're not because they're um, in New York. And um, so we're excited about the future of it, excited about publishing more books uh, in this space, a ton more books with Lee, hopefully. And um, yeah, we're, we're in a good spot right now. We're very excited. So thanks again for having us. You're very welcome, Chris. And I just, um, both Lee's books are very, very beautiful, but I think you really topped it with uh, Jimmy Shine's book. And I just want to tell the audience that I hosted Jim Shine on Friday for a talk about his beautiful book. And I'll include the, um, oh gosh, I haven't actually processed the video yet. The video <laughs> will be available on our YouTube channel, the Mechanics Institute's YouTube channel, shortly. Uh, it's been a busy, busy uh, history <laughs> days for me. Um, all right, so thank you, Chris. And now I am thrilled to introduce Lori Krill. Take it away, Lori. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the West Coast Acquisitions Editor for the History Press, which is under the umbrella of Arcadia Press, which you've probably seen everywhere. They're the sepia-toned um, uh, picture books with the history in, uh, attached to them. Um, the History Presses are more text-based imprint. So we do a lot of uh, longer books with, yes, there they are. <laughs> um, and there we have, uh, we have, thou we have about 15,000 um, books in our, in our back catalog. So we've done quite a few. Um, those are mostly those uh, sepia tone covered images of America books. So the History Press um, was acquired by Arcadia in 2014, and we do uh, more of the narrative-based side. So we, we look for um, books that are uh, more text than pictures, but we still use illustrations and photographs, usually historical photographs, as an important part of the narrative in our books. And we're really focused on the regional and local aspect of all of our books. Um, we do have a lot of different what we consider series 
that um, each you know city kind of fills its own niche in that series. They're all very different from each other, but they're all about the same topic. Like we have a series, uh, American Palette series that all covers like regional foods or um, restaurants in a particular area. So we do try to find regional themes that work uh, nationwide um, to kind of tie all of our books together. So I know that a lot of times when people come to me, they're have a really great idea um, that is a very big idea that we have to kind of make sure that we're focusing on their community. That, and, and I know that sometimes that can be a little difficult to kind of find the sweet spot between just talking about a family history and then talking about a, a national era that happened. So we, we're kind of the publisher that looks for the book in between those two, um, kind of, of books, those kinds of history books, that more of a community narrative and community memories that br bring other people from your town into the book and help them understand more about their own local history. Um, I have been working for the History Press for about four years now. I'm a graduate of the Denver Publishing Institute. Um, and before that, I was a police officer. So my personal, um, preferences tend to lean towards true crime, but there's tons and tons of really interesting um, other series that I really enjoy. Um, I just really love working on those ones in particular. I've gotten to work with a couple of judges in, in California who had some really great old cases that they wanted to write about, and that's always a lot of fun for me. Um, but I love learning about where I grew up in California um, and then all the areas around there, even though I'm out here in Charleston now. But I know you guys have a lot of questions and um, I think probably you don't need to listen to me talk as much as uh, maybe have some of these questions answered and talk to some of these great panelists. So thanks for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Well, thank you so much, Lori. I have to say, I am fascinated by your background. Do you um, ever employ your police training when... <laughs> with authors. Oh, luckily, <laughs> luckily, there's no need for that <laughs> now that I'm working in editing. I was an English major and I was only a police officer for five years. So it's just kind of more of a, like a diverse kind of background that I bring into it. Um, it's fun to work with, with ex-cops or retired cops or retired judges because I can usually tell when they're pulling um, material directly from a police report because the language is very, very specific and I always recognize it. And I'm like, can we make this a little less police report and a little bit more conversational? That would be great. Um, but other than that, no, everybody is very well behaved. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I know us authors can get a little excited sometimes. <laughs> um, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and take some questions? There are a lot of goodies here. Uh, let's see here. Nicole asks, um, and you know, if, if you just want to unmute yourselves, then and just go ahead and jump in. We'll we'll uh, answer questions as you can each answer a question if it appeals to you. Um, so Nicole asks, uh, that says she is a she's an aspiring long format writer with lots of articles uh, under her belt. Um, and she's curious about where she should start if she's thinking of a bigger, I assume she's thinking of a bigger project like a book. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, I mean, you have to have a topic or, or a subject. You have to decide if you have something that, um, that is sufficiently interesting that it could actually be a book topic. Um, and you also have to figure out if you have something that is sufficiently interesting that you don't mind spending five to 10 years on. That's very, very important because writing a book takes much longer than you ever uh, expect. It's much, much harder than you ever dreamed. And so you have to make you know, sure that you really have a topic that you're interested in. Um, you know, you also... Um, ask this question down below about how do you take large subjects that might be dry and make them approachable. I think I would give some information about that is, that is also 
relevant to your first question. I think learning to be a long form writer is definitely a process. And you know what, um, when you start to write a book, you don't always know what you're writing about. And you might have a lot of different themes or you know, historical moments or different characters. And you're trying to figure out how to put something together in a coherent way. And I think a very helpful thing to do when you're starting a project is to write every scene you can think of. Uh, if you're writing about some architectural history, you could write about the origins of a building. Who, what was the personal life of the architect? Who was the person who hired that person to build that building? What was the economy like? What was the society like? And you just start writing things down um, that are specific and that are rich in detail. And sort of by doing that, you start to better understand what possible uh, book or larger project you have. And it, it, writing is such a, is so process driven and you have to let the process work. You, you, you can't just go in saying, I, I want to write a book and expect that it's going to happen right away. It does take a lot of, of learning. Yeah, and just to comment on that, you really have to make sure that you have the the primary sources to actually make a story. You know, if you only have a handful of letters, you're going to have to do a lot of digging in order to have enough uh, a skeleton there in order to to, to put your scenes on. Um, well, thank you for that. Anyone else have any? Further comments on yeah I just wanted to say that we work with people who actually um, are often uh, community like newspaper journalists local paper who actually have written hundreds of articles and usually about you know their local history and we structure our books in a way that uh, a lot of our books are about one subject, but a lot of our books are actually kind of like a compilation of articles. Every chapter is about a building, for example, and then the next chapter would be about a different building in your area. So you can take your library of past articles and come to us with a very strong idea of what your favorite thing to write about is. And we can often um, figure out kind of how that might fit our particular press because we do so many different topics within the regional history framework um, that a lot of times we're able to come up with something that can be a lot of fun for the readers that might not be about one person or one building, but it might be about a collection um, of people or buildings that all have a very similar uh, background or the same era, something along those lines. So it's not necessarily a huge jump from being a an article writer to being a long form writer on our end. But you still have to have kind of a, a concrete proposal idea ready yeah. to show the publisher. Yeah, it's always really helpful. Um, I give feedback on tables of content sometimes. So if you think that you are close, um, I, I've often brainstorm with uh, authors to kind of figure out exactly what where they might fit on our list um, and that you know that's just something that i do with a lot of my current authors also i work with a lot of debut authors as well so it's not necessarily a roadblock to me if you haven't done a long book yet um, or to any of my colleagues we work with a lot of different people who this might be their first book even if they have writing experience here's a question that i'm sure you all have a little bit to comment on, do you recommend going through an agent with your proposal or do you think it's better with history to just propose directly to the publisher? Well, I, can, I can sort of jump in on this one since um, it's, it's so interesting, you know, when Chris was talking about regional publishing because uh, at the time, so when I, when I was putting together my uh, book proposal for my book about the Pan Pacific Exposition, it was really um, it was really pegged to the 100th anniversary, which was coming up in 2015. So I knew I kind of had to rush. And as it turned out, there were already some books that were had already been started um, or had been sort of commit. The publisher had been co committed to. Heyday had already made their commitment to it. So. Um, this this uh, this this point about you know agents um, is I think 
I think it's better to really learn how to write a, a very short proposal and very, very much get at the essence of this, uh, of what the book is about. I, I think it had like, you know, what Francis said already, I think it's just that it has to be compelling. It has to really um, feel like there's something, you know, there's, there's layers to it. It isn't just a single magazine article. It's something that has more uh, complexity and layers. Uh, I mean, this is something Taryn can talk about. She's been researching a particular Mechanics Institute founder for years. And it just, she keeps turning up more and more interesting things. Like, um, I think making sure that you have, like, can put together, like, a chapter or 2,000 word essay that just is really gets people excited to say, I want more. Uh, I think that's really where to focus. And, um, and if that piece of writing is good, a publisher is going to find is, is going to want to engage because it's the writing, it's the, it's the subject matter, it's the, it's the way that you're coming at it. Those are the things that will put you a, apart from others. I'm not saying that it isn't good to get an agent, but I think so many people worry. Uh, the funnel for, you know, the major publishers is really, really skinny. And, um, and you're competing against a lot of other people for the agents as well. Uh, if you have an agent that you know or you can work with and they will actually review your material and tell you where it is, or if you have people that are great readers that will go after your material and not be, you know, be frank and be honest, not brutal, and really help you kind of uh, get that material into really good shape. So I, I really highly recommend working with an editor. I worked with um, Laura Frazier, who uh, helped me with just getting some of my essays off the ground. And I think editors are really helpful in that way because they allow you to, um, they just give you a different perspective and, and, they, and they examine it at, at, as, as a really, really good reader would, but they give you the instructions to kind of say, okay, this is how you have to set this up because you know, you're mixing this with this and it's just not, it's not, it's not working. Uh, so anyway, those are just a couple of points I think might be helpful. I'll speak to this really briefly. I agree with what you just said, Lee. Um, you know, it really depends where you're seeking to publish. If you're seeking to publish with one of the big five publishers in New York City, you have to have an agent. Uh, and it's daunting to get an agent, but we are blessed in the Bay Area to have so many excellent writing conferences and places like the Mechanics Institute um, that have, uh, you know, writing conferences where agents come and they want to meet writers. I mean, one of the things about agents is they need clients. Uh, so, you know, I would partake of uh, San Francisco Writers Conference has like a meet and greet. I know women in publishing does. I myself met my agent. I went to the community of writers at Squaw Valley um, and I met him up there. Uh, and, you know, getting an agent can also be like building a relationship. You know, it doesn't necessarily ha happen immediately. Um, but I think the best way to get an agent and the best way to get published is exactly what Lee says. You have to produce some compelling writing and you know working with someone like Laura who's, a, who's written a couple amazing books herself you know or you have a writing group I, I personally have a writing group we've been together for 15 years like I really trust what they say you need to surround yourself with people who can give you good feedback to make your writing the best it can be before you go and try to sort of sell your your work to an agent or publisher. Uh, you gave some really great um, references. I'm just going to put the Women's National Book Association link to the San Francisco chapter in the chat space because they host um, meet and greets all the time and the San Francisco Writers Conference does as well. And Mechanics Institute hosts all kinds of events with agents, with editors, so at least you can get some names. Um, so I'm going to put all that in the chat. Did anyone else have any comments about agents, editors? One thing I'm curious about is, let's say, do you, do you consult an editor before you finish your book proposal? Do you send that draft proposal to an editor or do you just go for it, send it to a publisher, and then, you know, go with, work with an editor after that? Um, I'll take that one. I work with uh, authors who do both. Um, we actually have our own proposal form. So 
when an author sends me a proposal that's already finished, it's very easy for me to see kind of how they could slot that into what kind of information we need um, to get the book approved. Uh, so that's always really, really helpful if you have a very strong idea of what you're looking for. I really um, encourage uh, authors to have, as was mentioned, a writing group or some kind of um, person that they can uh, work with while they're writing. Um, we do a lot of books per year, the History Press does, so we're not able to give a lot of really super one-on-one -on -one personal attention, even though we would love to. Um, it's just not something that we have the time for. So it's always good to have a secondary person as your eyes on that. We rarely work with authors who have agents. Um, in our press, it's just kind of a smaller press, so we just don't end up with a lot of those agented authors that I have in the past um, ha worked with agents as well. It's not required for us. So most of the people that we work with don't have one. Uh, that's great advice there. Um, and that's heartening too, because it's kind of stressful to consider, not only do you have to get yourself all gussied up to meet an, off, uh, meet an agent, but then you also have to uh, you have to woo the publisher as well, and I know that's the agent's job. But you know it's all pressure for the author. Um, okay, let's see. Let's ask another question from the audience. Um, C.J. Verberg asks: Are any of you involved with historical fiction, or specifically historical mysteries? Is that part of your purview? Not mine, really. No, we don't do any historical fiction or historical uh, mysteries, really. We're very nonfiction, true crime um, in that genre, if you're looking at that. Um, now, Lana, here's a question for you. How, if one has an idea for an article, do you require a proposal of some sort, or are you a little more uh, free form or tell me about the, um, the the acquisition process for the Argonaut because sure. that's really that's really the you know San Francisco Bay Area's if you're an aspiring author I'd say try to write an article for the Argonaut because it's it's easy and yeah, fun. So, so we do want a written proposal it doesn't have to be a, um, a really elaborate proposal but it has to be enough to give us a good sense of what you want to cover and that you have the background that, that is needed to cover it. It's also helpful to have a little bit of text, even if you do an introduction and you know, a few hundred words, just to give a sense of, 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 of the writing. Um, so put that together and the process is there's a, there's a committee that reviews uh, proposals that come in and that committee is me and Charles Braccio, who's the publisher of the Argonaut and Laurie Ungaretti, who uh, is an editor, basically we will take a look. And the criteria, again, is really, it's gotta be San Francisco focused. And um, we like articles that, that are approach topics that haven't been overdone by so many people that, that everybody will know. So it's really the nooks and the crannies. So I would say the quick answer is yes, a proposal and a, and a sample, and, um, and that's all what we would need. Great, and touching on that also, Chris, can you, can you describe the book idea, the concept that really lights your fire? Because the, the materials that you've produced with Lee's two books and Jimmy Shine's book, um, those are just the ones I have on my shelf, but it looks like you really go for books that have a, you know potential for beauty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, that for us, again, with Cameron and company specifically, it's visuals, like a, a story, obviously, it needs to be a great story. Um, but our books tend to be driven by the visuals. So if it's a history book, you know, the countless hours I know that Lee and our team put into uh, scouring the archives of Mechanics Institute libraries throughout, you know, the Bay Area. If you have that supporting work and, and also looking into what the costs are for those assets you know sometimes there's some hefty licensing fees or or just scanning fees which add up if you've got 150 you know photographs that you're scanning so but really like you know i don't, I don't have a, a magic formula by any means obviously doing your homework when it comes to 
what we call comp titles, so comparable books where you can really convince a publisher and say, hey, this book did well, and I think my book sort of falls in that same category. Obviously not, it doesn't have to be a perfect comp because then you probably shouldn't do it if it's the exact same book, but um, something that uh, had success where we can look up the numbers and then you know get some feedback from our sales team, and say, hey, this book sold quite well, um, and we think this book will do similarly. And then, you know, it goes without saying, it's sort of frustrating, I know, but anytime you can get some kind of big name uh, blurb or endorsement or, you know, forward or preface, uh, that always helps. You know, it gets a foot in the door at places that helps book buyers um, at our, you know, local bookstores, you know, raises their eyes like, oh, this is a, a, a debut author, but they have, you know, somebody of notability or notoriety um, you know, endorsing the book, that certainly helps. So I thought, yeah, there's no, obviously not a, a perfect thing. We're small. Um, and so sometimes it just has to, um, you know, catch my eye or catch somebody on our eye. And I, I will say just on the agent thing, you know, you know, we work more and more with agents. Um, but uh, obviously, it's almost as hard to get an agent these days as it is to get a publisher. And so um, I think, you know, from a business standpoint, agents can be extremely helpful in letting the writer be the writer and let the agent handle sort of the business side of it so that you don't get bogged down in that. So we personally, you know, Cameron Company, almost, you know, you'd think it's uh, the other way around, but we tend to prefer working with agents just so, you know, we don't have to educate an author every time a clause comes up in a contract that they're nervous about or things like that. So agents certainly, you know, good ones really are worth their 15 percent um but it's, again it's hard to get there so maybe you get published and that will help you know my first job in publishing i was an intern for amy rennert who's a wonderful agent here in the bay area she's based in tiburon um, i was in charge of the slush pile i was um, killing everyone's dreams left and right by sending rejection letters um so sorry if that was one of you um but it's uh you know that's a lot and she was getting gobs and gobs of them and i would imagine she's getting probably 10 times more now just because it's mostly all digital and so it's so much easier for people to email uh, manuscripts than it was to mail them with a, a self-addressed stamped envelope so um, anyway those are, that's just my two cents so sorry i don't have a perfect response for what we're looking for but those are hopefully a couple of tips that might help well sometimes you don't know what the secret sauce is going to be until you taste it right that's um, right I yeah do I do have a question about your philosophy regarding comp titles because as a librarian I work with I get a lot of questions from you know writers who are struggling over this aspect of their proposal you know sometimes you hear that the comp title should be books that are similar but different like where your book would be on the shelf in response in relation to these other books but maybe it sounds like you want a little bit more publication data behind the titles that you that you submit as your comp titles. Yeah, I mean, I think if you can point to two, three, even four books that you feel like are really in that same, doesn't have to be, again, doesn't have to be the same genre necessarily, um, but something um, hitting on a similar story, subject matter, or maybe a, a geography, uh, a region. You know, right now we're, we're looking into doing a Warriors book uh, about the Golden State Warriors. And um, it, there, there isn't a perfect comp for the book that we're working on, but there are other obviously warriors related books, maybe a Steph Curry biography or something um, where you can show that, man, the same market, the same target market that's going to be interested in your book would most likely also be interested in this book. And like, wow, they sold 30,000 copies of that book. So that can convince an acquisitions team that there, there's a broad base of people who are interested. And that's the, what's shocking about the regional side of it um, which has taken me a little while to wrap my brain around, you know, Bob Cameron, who started our company, made his business on just regional publishing. And you think, oh, you're just, you're selling yourself short by just doing a book about San Francisco when you, you know, you're not going to sell books outside of San Francisco. But obviously, again, most of you probably know this, but when there's a book about a specific region, then you're automatically, you know, elevated on the radar. You're, you're getting uh, great merchandising at bookstores, you're getting faced out, you're getting the attention of the local stores. And that can then obviously bleed into, uh, you know, outer geographies at the same time. So yeah, uh, hope that sort of answers your question. Maybe not. It does. It just, uh, 
provides a little more anxiety. That's all. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, hey, Richard has a question for the historians here. Um, can you offer any tips to researching and publishing eventually um, about your famous relatives without offending their direct descendants, especially if they are on the wrong side of the law? Obviously, you can't use a pseudonym for them. <laughs> so, yeah, that's always, a, it's almost like a memoir question. I mean, I think people who write with, are writing memoir are grappling with this all the time. And I think it's really a delicate dance. You have to, you know, you, 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 I, I think chances are good you could offend your relatives. I think the thing that I would do would be to alert them that you're doing this and this is the point of view you're taking and this is the information you've discovered and you plan to publish it. Um, and, you know, give them an opportunity to give you some feedback on the work you're doing. Uh, you don't want to I'll give them permission to sort of say you can't do the project. But I think if you have material that is, um, you know, reveal something unflattering about somebody in your family, uh, you know, you, you, you just got to go with the truth. I mean, I'm, if you're writing a nonfiction book, you have to go with the truth. You just have to think of a way to delicately involve your family and, so that they feel heard. They don't have to, you don't have to do what they said, but you have to make sure that they feel heard. That would be my advice. I would agree with Francis. It often comes up in even in Argonaut articles that um, people are talking about their families and somebody was arrested or somebody made a bad business deal or they went broke or they may, maybe killed someone. Or and I think that's partly the role where the editor comes in because the editor can sort of help you to use language that that is truthful but but is isn't offensive. You know, you can tone tone it down a little bit. So I think between contacting the descendants and the relatives and making sure that they're aware and making sure that you're talking about it in the best possible way. I think that's about all you can do. Well, you can always get legal advice and sometimes that there's no, um, no way around that. <laughs> Paying for an attorney for an hour is a lot cheaper than um, getting sued, right? <laughs> um, just to, just to yeah. chime in a little bit on that, I mean, I didn't, um, I didn't encounter that issue uh, when I was, you know, going through the letters and material of my great grandfather, but um, it is kind of interesting, um, you know, uh, that's a great grandfather. I had, you know, around family members and, and everybody surviving uh, to that extent, you know, great license to kind of go and, and do this. I mean, I wasn't telling people that I was doing this book before I did it. Um, however, once it came out, it was just like there were so many things that people learned from the family that they never knew and they would never know. And so I think exactly what Francis says, it's, it's, it's that tapestry of, the, of how the truth fits in. It has a way of actually exercising some of those demons. I mean, to a certain extent, my great grandfather was a, uh, an anti-progressive and where it put him in a certain camp, but there were certain aspects to him. I mean, it didn't even get into all the political aspects for, of his, um, how, he, how he ended up, you know, working through some of these big issues around the fair, the commerce, uh, with um, some, some of the powerhouses of the day that were like Hearst and, uh, and Spreckles. I mean, it just, it's, um, so there's certain things that you can never get to in um, historical nonfiction because you're not in the meeting room with where they were and you can get hints from letters and whatnot. But um, I think at the, at, you know, as you, as you relate to that as, as the writer, I mean, you are doing a service. I mean, I really do believe that uh, um, that's, that's an important point of, of how you undertake this. Because if you are sort of gun shy about undertaking that, then you should probably think twice. But I'm, um, I, I, I do think it serves future generations and your family. So that's my, my idea. Thank you for that. And let's answer, let's ask one last question from Mary. Um, do people, maybe this is directly to Lana, but do people ever write the whole article or do they, do you prefer that they send a proposal and then you work together to actually finish the article? So sometimes people write the whole article, and it's also happened that sometimes an article that's been printed in one journal, we want to repurpose in the Argonauta. They'd like to maybe expand a little bit on it. So yeah, that, that happens too. And it's not that 
that shouldn't happen. I mean, if somebody has a, uh, if they've gone to the trouble to write an entire article and they've got it and they want to pitch it, they, they should certainly do that. But what I would want to avoid is if somebody had high hopes for getting something in the Argonaut and instead of running it by the committee, they took all the time to write it and then it wasn't really right. So that's the reason for doing a proposal first. But yeah, if somebody's got one that's written, great. Well, that's heartening. All right, we are um, bumping up on time, but I want to thank um, Lori and Chris and Lana. You've all three of you have made your um, respective publishers uh, so much more approachable um, to us aspiring, emerging authors. Um, and Francis and Lee, uh, thank you also because you have such um, such uh, experience under your belt that you can. Uh, that that you know that I really appreciate you sharing because you know it puts our again us uh, emerging authors our struggles in perspective everyone has these struggles <laughs> so thank you all for attending um, and sharing your knowledge with us I really appreciate it and you know the uh, the thanks are coming in through the chat space of course you can see it too thank you Tara for organizing it all awesome job yeah, thank yeah. you, Taryn. Really well done. Thank you, Taryn. And I, one last thing to say, I would just say, and it goes without saying, read, 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 buy books at your local bookstore so you can see what's selling and what book buyers think is going to sell. And usually what they face out will sell. And so just visit your local bookstore all the time. <laughs> and read Publishers Weekly. That's what I tell people to do because it's so, <laughs> so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Little tidbits and and. Uh, yes, it's all, uh, it's directed towards, you know, it's about the publishing community, but you need to start thinking about that, even though you're lost in the rapture of, of research, um, you have to always be thinking about what the product is that you're actually working towards. So, mm -hmm. all right, thanks you all. Um, hope you stay cool on this hot day. And uh, <laughs> thanks for tuning in, Lori from, from Charleston. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>